Good. Good afternoon, everybody. We're waiting a couple of more minutes to see if people are joined, if more people are joining, and then we get started. And yeah, welcome to our the second series of our um, webinar series, the second uh, second part of our series on um, biodiversity. And today we will talk about uh, the the connection between biodiversity and climate change, and uh, look specifically at the global framework for, on biodiversity, um, what it can do, what it is doing, and what what we can expect of it in future. Okay, as said before, we today focus on climate change and uh, and um, biodiversity, the internexus, and um, um, we look at uh, what we can expect from from negotiations in Colombia, etc. And we are very happy to have Nile here with us today. Um, Nile has been working on climate change and on biodiversity since many many years, and uh, she has even been. Negotiator, climate change, yeah, uh, negotiate, um, ne negotiator for Colombia uh, and at the UNFCCC, and um, has had a, has been part of the steering committee of the goal, um, of the CBD Alliance for many years, and now works for Friends of the Earth International. And she, yeah, has a lot of expertise to share with us today. Nelly, we're very happy to have you here with us today. And um, yes, please go ahead. We decided that we would first um, focus on climate change and then go more into detail in the, to the framework. Thank you very much, Johanna, and, and hello, everybody. And thank you so much for having me. Just a small correction. I was a climate negotiator for Bolivia and for Colombia. And actually, Bolivia. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> I... But it's important because Bolivia at that time was actually a country that really brought the voice of civil society. And so I feel like even though I've been an official, I've always been at the side of civil society. So in, in that sense, it's important. But, but no worries. Um, I will start talking first about climate and biodiversity, then we will have a question and answer session, and then I will talk about the global biodiversity framework, and we will again have a question and answer session. I feel it's a lot, so I might be going a bit like too much on a top level, we can go in depth in, in the questions a bit more, um, and maybe there will be other opportunities, but so yeah. I, it is a lot. I will start sharing my screen, if that's all right, so that I can show you my presentation. Um, okay, where do I? Hey, it all at once looks different now than it was a moment ago. Ah, here I think. No. Just a second. <laughs> We tested this a moment ago and then it worked fine. Okay. Sorry, sorry about that. Okay. Um there we go. Okay, fine. So here's my presentation. Um let me start it. So as I said, I will talk about biodiversity and climate first. And in that, I will go into two parts. First, like how do <clears throat> climate and biodiversity interact? And second, um, about the policy, which I think is a more interesting part, but I think it's important to understand a little bit about the interaction between climate and biodiversity. Um, I think it's very clear, I don't need to say this, that climate change will affect biodiversity and biodiversity will affect climate change. Um, and I think it's also quite important to just 
remind ourselves that so many other factors will influence all of it. Land use changed due to agribusiness infrastructure, mining, toxins, all of them impact, impact both on climate change and on biodiversity, but also other aspects such as deforestation, um, war, waste, industry, of course, fossil fuels, of course, but also issues such as overconsumption, overpopulation. So when I'm talking about this interaction, don't ask me like split it all just perfectly all because everything interacts with, with everything. Nevertheless, I wanted to give a few quick elements and I'll go to, through this quite quickly um, of the impact of climate on biodiversity. So first one is habitat loss. As the temperature rise, just the habitats shrink. Many of them, coral reefs, ice caps, forests, um, many things shrink. And there is a, and this is a, a UN data, 41% of mal mammals are risking to lose their habitat with a 3%, 3 degrees um, increase. I'm not going to go into details of the of that map. The ocean acidification, you will probably know as the climate rises as in carbon there's more carbon in the air actually the ocean has a capacity to suck it all up the capacity of the ocean so far keeps on increasing so every year the ocean absorbs more carbon than the year before but this comes as a high cost um, what happens is that the ocean becomes every time more um, acidic we are now at 30 percent more acidity than uh, in pre-industrial times and this severely affects um, life in the in the ocean, specifically coral reefs, really really suffer with a two degree um, two degree rise. There's a, there's a risk of ninety nine percent of reefs to to vanish, um, and of course when reefs vanish, then um, fish and, and all all habitat in 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 the in, in the ocean also vanishes, and that would then also really impact um, what all on biodiversity and climate later on as well. Um, other effects of how climate change will impact biodiversity is the distribution of species. So some species need to start moving up north, others need to move up, up the mountain, others can't move at all. So the effect you have of that is that also species who actually used to collaborate to, to live benefiting from one another, they can't do so anymore. So this can lead, lead to, to ecosystem collapse. Even worse, so if you have an island effect, so that can be an island, but it could be a mountain area or fragmented ecosystems where as species try to move further, they actually can't anymore because it's a very small area. And that leads, leads to even quicker ecosystem destruction. A similar effect to the, the species moving is actually the species moving, how they react in time. So for example, um, flowering might happen earlier, but uh, migrating species might come back late, like on their normal time, and then actually they don't have the food they, they were used to. So the, this kind of, of imbalances severely affect ecosystems functioning as well. Another very direct effect, which we are already seeing of climate on biodiversity is that pests really get enhanced a lot. There's this, this picture here comes from a, a, pine, um, a pine forest in Canada, which used to always have mountain pine beetle, but every winter this mountain pine beetle was severely frozen, of course. And it would therefore be quite better that it would take quite a while during the year until it come back and, and it would let, there would be a certain balance. Now, as the winters aren't so, so cold anymore, actually the, the mountain beetle doesn't get this battering every winter and it just keeps on growing. And entire forests are going lost. We were speaking about like huge parts of this forest, which is just going lost. Similarly, invasive species might just try or will try a lot more in, in, in ecosystems with higher temperatures, again, affecting biodiversity. <clears throat> and of course, very sadly, when we have real extreme events, um, droughts, floodings, fires, um, you get a, a huge extinction of a lot of, of biodiversity at once. And it's not always clear if ecosystems can recover. So it's very clear with all of this that there is a, a, a severe impact of climate on biodiversity. Now, if we want to see the biodiversity loss, which impact does that have on climate? It's important to know a few things. All living beings are made up of significant proportions of carbon. And this is very rough numbers, but plants 50%, animals, including ourselves, 18 to 20%. 
plankton different types between 30 and 50 percent um, when biodiversity get lost also the carbon get lost in those body and in biodiversity in ecosystems and as the threats to biodiversity is, is high there's a serious risk of further climate change happening because of this just to give you an idea this this graph is a few years old it's from 2018 so probably it's worse by now but the total amount of carbon stored in all the plants currently living on earth is roughly the similar as the total amount of fossil fuels being burned since the industrial revolution so just to give you an idea of how important it is to have all these these plants and how important it is to balance this but of course, we are not exactly balancing it there. The amount of deforestation is huge and it has been quite high during the last few years, especially as due to climate change, forest fires are increasing quite a bit. There's this general statistic of 12 to 20% of global annual carbon emissions come due to deforestation and, and other land use changes. These numbers are very difficult to pinpoint whatever you search, you find different numbers. But this gives a general indication. So, of course, and the other impact is um, ocean acidification. As I already mentioned, what happens with ocean acidification, but you see there a, a completely bleached coral reef. It's clear there is no capacity for life anymore. And of course, that will severely impact the, um, the capacity of the ocean to keep on doing this, this huge job it's doing for us to, to keep on absorbing more carbon. There is, scientists are really worried that there is a tipping point in which like actually oceans will become a carbon source in, instead of a carbon sink. So for where we started with the impact of climate on biodiversity is really serious. The impact of biodiversity loss is also serious. Now, now I want to jump to the policy part. When we are thinking about this panorama, it's very, very clear that actually whatever kind of environmental policies we want to do, this needs to address both of them. Actually, what we are seeing is something completely different. We see a carbon tunnel vision. The UNFCCC and carbon ministries and carbon finance, they have taken the upper hand. And every kind of thinking is in terms of carbon. One of the major plans and, and projects and policies is all around, we need a lot of carbon being stored in, in biomass, in forests, but there's a wrong definition of forests. Any area with a sufficient amount of tree canopy is called a forest, according to the found how definition. And that means that monoculture tree plantations are considered to be forests. For example, the bond challenge, which was made in 2011, it talked about 1.35 million square mil miles of forests. When we analyze this, we see that 45% of those that are being executed are actually monoculture tree plantations. A lot of them, fast growing trees like acacia, eucalyptus, etc., which are actually hugely damaging for the environment. Um, and they are there not to actually do something for the environment, they're mostly there to for profit, for, for example, well, for people or other industrial uses. So this is a, a real carbon tunnel vision, but it, the, the idea of, oh, plant a trillion trees, we need to plant more trees, that is just, it's being repeated over and over again. Um, well, I think many of you will know the, the, the problems, but it's, it's extremely bad for biodiversity to have monoculture tree plantations. There's no native trees once, the, the plants which are there to do this, it's, it's just not possible because we don't have the amount of land available. So it, this actually replaces other important land uses, often indigenous land uses or other valuable ecosystems, etc. It uses up a lot of water, especially if we're talking about species such as eucalyptus, etc. So this again damages ecosystems. And it's a short-term solution, especially plantations are very prone to, to forest fires, as we have seen in Portugal, for example, where all the plantations went up in fire. And if we think that this is really something that can capture carbon, think also about all the energy investment in this kind of planting and harvesting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's very heavy industry-based. Another one of the huge climate um, proposals is biofuels and biomass. Again, what we see is that this is heavily based upon um, either um, 
for um, plantations or monoculture crops such as ethanol for such as um, sugarcane for for ethanol which you see here um, the idea of this is that actually as a crop grows or a tree grows it will capture the carbon through the photosynthesis or also as, as the example here this is a microalgae um, any any of them it captures the carbon out of the air so and then when it's used, it's burned, it releases it again. But no worries, because we will plant it again, and so it will again be, be captured. So therefore, it's supposed to be carbon neutral. This is an absolute false thing for many reasons. Well, if we're talking about biodiversity, this is based on fertilizers, pesticides, GMOs, plantations, everything which is very, very negative for biodiversity. Um, also, the, the way of how to manage this is a very high energy input. You really need a lot of machinery, long distance travel, etc., in order to make the system work. And the energy being produced is highly in inefficient. And maybe more, worst of all, all of this is really in very strict corporate control. So you're not talking about people's based solutions. But this is really being one of the big solutions being put forward. As we see, biofuel support in the world um, is huge. These are the countries who promote it. All industrialized countries, all high growth countries are really pushing for this. While actually it's very negative for biodiversity. So again, what we see is that the climate arena has a prevalence over the biodiversity thinking and, and solutions, etc. Which also comes because carbon is just a one single concept. It's very simple to think about, and biodiversity is incredibly complex, and, and you really need to work on the ground with it, which is something politicians can't really do. The worst one of all of them, and I know I'm late, but I would really want to, to go into this for quite a bit. Um, I think the worst one of all of them is the nature based solutions which started from the idea that biodiversity can save the climate. There was this very famous paper, which was published in 2017, which was called Nature, Natural Climate Solutions. It claimed that 37% um, of the mitigation needed can come from actually biodiversity capture the, capturing the carbon in, in, in the air. Um, this study has a lot of flaws. One of them is that there's that, that there's 768 million hectares available for reforestation, which is the size twice the size of India. This land is not available. And when you look at it, this like all the, the authors, most of them are actually coming from the Nature Conservancy, who are actually very much interested in the, they, their business model, even if it's an NGO where they have a business model, is based upon providing offsets for corporations. So yeah, it's very clear where this comes from. But this paper was hugely influential and it really set up on a lot of talk about um, nature-based solutions. Um, so yeah, when we see what kind of projects actually happen and with this kind of nature-based solutions, I'm just giving one example here, which is in, in total and total oil in the DRC Congo. Um, where um, they have a very damaging oil concession, but they say like, no worries, we will we will compensate, we will actually do positive things for nature, a nature-based solution in the Savannah Park, National Park, um, where they now reforest it because supposedly Savannah is not a forest. So they reforest it with non-native species, which will be oriented towards profit. They, they receive development aid for it, and they make sure that actually, thanks to this nature-based solutions project, there's no complaint about the oil concessions. But actually, when we look at it, the loss of the savanna is incredibly bad for biodiversity, um, because there's so many species living in, in the savanna. It's an incredibly rich ecosystem. And even for climate, it's maybe not so visible, but the amount of root systems underground in the savanna is really big, and this captures a lot of climate as well. So a lot of this is just based upon false stories, but as long as you can sell the idea that you're doing something positive, then, then it flies. Some of the characteristics of the NBS, There's, there is now a definition in UNIA, um, but it's quite sloppy and there's several other definitions as well. But it does, up till now, there's no clarity what can be defined as a nature-based solution and whatnot. 
There's no UN-based criteria. IUCN has some criteria, but they're highly contested. There's no one single standard for anybody, which means that anybody can use these concepts. And so it goes. And what, what actually we see is that there's a lot of small scale, beautiful projects with indigenous peoples in a mangrove, et cetera, et cetera. They get into the brochures and the big ugly projects um, for Microsoft planting hectares and hectares of, of um, monoculture tree plantations, they just say like, oh, we are capturing so much carbon, but you don't get to see a picture of a monoculture tree plantation. A lot of the NBS projects are corporate-led. If you go into corporate websites, you will see a lot of, of NBS um, claims. Um, very much linked to green, to greenwashing. And as the corporate sector is in, interested, there's a lot of talk also amongst the UN scene that NBS will bring a lot of private investment. Now let's think about it. When we are talking about investment, that means that corporation or whoever is invested wants a return on investment. They don't just come to say like, oh, let's support this small scale, what's it? No, they really want a return on investment, which comes in different ways. It comes with clearing their name. It comes with getting control over land. It comes with um, having the right of, of carbon offsets, which they can use or sell. And it comes with interest in possibility of using whatever is the outcome of these, you know, of these plantations as well, when that's the case. So really, there's so much talk about the private investments that NBS will, will bring, but very little about what actually is the consequences of attracting this investment. We've tried to ask these questions and they're just completely reflected, there's not even a reflection about it. Then there's the other part of it, which is the climate pledges in the UNFCCC. So as you're probably aware, after the Paris Agreement, every country needed to make a pledge on how they are going to reduce their emissions. And as for almost every country, it's near impossible to really come to the levels which are needed. They all say that they will do a land use change pledge so that they will reforest or they will, they will use land in order to capture carbon. When we are looking at this, we see that here are the land use change pledges, 633 million hectares, which are in the, in the, in the cumulative of all the, um, of all the, um, the NDCs, including uh, 81, um, 81 million hectares of backs. I'll come back to the backs later. Um, and there's even a, a projected range of, of backs um, up to 480 uh, million hectares. This comes, comes on top of the already existing cropland. And when we're talking about these land use change pledges, we're talking a lot again about monoculture tree plantations. The, re for, the restoration pledges, they actually come aside here. So they are not really taken, taken into account into what is so dangerous. And then we see that there's actually a projected agriculture expansion range up till another 200 million hectares. Now, this is all above what is already the planetary boundary for permanent croplands. So something is really not working. This land does not exist, yet all of the countries are basing their pledges on this idea. Now, when we compare this with what happens in the CBD, where we are talking about nature positive, nature positive, according to the proponents, means that it's okay to lose nature somewhere, but you will compensate it somewhere else, either by restoring or by um, even preventing further loss, which doesn't make sense because if you're preventing loss somewhere and you actually allow um, the destruction somewhere, you're still losing one of the two ecosystems. In any case, I mean, it, I would need a lot more time to go in depth into this, but this this graph has been all over the, the CBD um, as proponents for nature positive, like including lots of the big conservation NGOs. What we see here is that actually they are saying that they can be net neutral by say 2029 and net positive by 2030. And then like just a, a wild projection which doesn't have any numbers. Now, if we compare the idea that in climate, the climate's um, pledges, they are saying that they will need a lot of land use change um, and, and a lot more forests in the UNF in order to, to fulfill their pledges. And in biodiversity, we're saying, actually, we are just about getting, getting neutral with our offsetting. So something doesn't really match there. So this is really, really dangerous. 
I think I, I'll just mention this and, and then I'll break because we're really, really late. So the, lo the last thing which I wanted to mention is that geoengineering has a huge impact on biodiversity. It actually is a moratorium in the CBP, in the, the Convention on Biological Diversity, on geoengineering because of its impacts on biodiversity. And this is um, yet in climates we are talking about um, how it should be governed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of it, just very quickly on bioenergy, carbon capture and storage, which is, if you remember the little scheme of, um, of the, the neutral bioenergy, now we are talking about the same, but with the idea that if you have a factor or a, an energy plant that when it burns the, the biomass, it actually manages to capture it and to put it underground. And therefore you become actually carbon negative. And this is one of the huge geoengineering proposals, which is there. Lots of climate models are based upon this and it's completely nonsense. There's the, the social impacts, the land grabbing, the food insecurity, the fact that it's based upon monoculture plantations, it's technologically uncertain, it's excessively expensive, um, it, there's the, it's very energy intensive to organize this. And when you put the, the, the CO2 underground, it's actually the risk of leakage is very high. So you would anyway bring it back to the atmosphere if that would happen. So I'm sorry that I made it so long. I'll stop sharing here so I can see you all. And let's um, have some minutes for, for questions and then I'll go to the other part. But I, I know I'm like, I really went overboard with my time, so I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but um, yeah, I would like to, to give a, a quick break so that people can, can ask questions or comments. Um, just quick mention that whoever is, um, if somebody here is not really fluent in English and wants to give a comment or question in Spanish or in French, I would respond to you in English, but I'm very happy to take that in case of somebody is is like feeling a bit unsecure to make your comment in, in English. So yeah, floor is open. Thanks a lot, Lena. That was really, really interesting seeing the only linkages that are often not that obvious. They are somewhere there. And um, yeah, it's very good to connect this these dots. And I think also from the last seminar, uh, connects well to the last seminars, looking at the solutions that are there at the table that are not really going to save biodiversity. So I think that's very important to see there is again. Um, are there any questions? Karen? Thanks so much. Um... Yeah, for a very sobering presentation. I mean, you kind of know about, you know, how serious things are, but it's it's I find it always shocking to, yeah, just be confronted again with with the reality. Um, but I mean, so not reading between the lines, but perhaps thinking about, you know, all the solutions that are being put on the table that are um false solutions. Um, mm -hmm. it, am I to understand from that that the solutions you would be advocating for is rewilding, allowing for continued <laughs> wilding and basically, un, yeah, I guess more uh, sustainable, yeah, not untouched nature, but obviously because that's also problematic, but, you know, I guess more, yeah, ways of living Societies living in more harmony and being less destructive of of the natural systems we see, um, and if if that is the kind of the what we need to be seeing more of, um, where where are the opportunities for for seeing that? Um, because I'm I'm from the Cape Town office um, in South Africa and. You know, I think our our entire conversation is completely um, completely saturated by you know the need to address poverty, the need to develop, the need to create jobs, and you know without like in the absence of a willingness to redistribute what has already been developed, what we are talking about is more extraction. 
Um, and so it, it, it's just, I guess it's, it's very difficult to, yeah, to, I guess, align these two realities on the one hand, what we know we need to do, but also on the other hand, um, <laughs> what we also need, <laughs> what we also know we need to do. Um, yeah, I don't know if I'm very, yeah, just, yeah, I don't know mm -hmm. if I'm very clear, but putting that on the table. Shall I answer, or is there anybody else having a question or comment, and she will take things together? It seems nobody else. Okay. Um, yes, I understand your dilemma very well. I think um, when we're talking about solutions, it's important to to have them small scale, people based, and not in hands of corporations. I think the corporate greed and the corporate um, push for keep on growing, keep on making more profits and never mind nature, that is big part of the problem. Yes, redistribution will be a huge part that is needed in that it's just impossible to, to keep the, the current structures which actually keep on getting worse. So that is really, really big part in it. And you asked about rewilding. Yes, rewilding can be quite important, um, but it's just the how you frame it. If you frame rewilding as oh, then it can capture carbon. And then as the carbon is captured, we are actually allowed to keep on emitting and keep on having more profits, then you have a huge problem. If you have rewilding as a, um, something extra to what is, what is happening elsewhere, then that is a lot better. Also, I think it's very important to understand that um, there are no empty lands in the world. Basically, there are no empty lands. So wherever you want to do rewilding, you really need to see who's living there, who, whose rights is this, um, and how are you dealing with that. And a lot, mostly where nature is well conserved, it is actually in the hands of indigenous peoples and local communities. So this needs to be, I was going to say involved, but even that is, it's not good enough. Like it needs to be part of them, it needs to be based upon them. They need to have a first voice in it and then it can work. So to have this, this rewilding thing of like, oh, well, let's have nature untouched and all of that. And then it, it just, we, let's let's keep them out because they might cut down a few a few trees. Um, that is such a negative conservation view, which just doesn't work either. So I think this is very important. The other thing is that we need to go against this view of, um, how much percentage for nature and how much percentage for us. Um, we need to integrate it a lot more. And also in, in the part of, of the world where actually there's a lot of, of uh, where humans live, where cities are, or like also in between the villages, the agriculture, all of that, there's a lot of measures that can happen there to actually enhance biodiversity and biodiversity can live well in agriculture's plots. If it's agroecology, it's full of I think now the connection was cut, no? Nila is frozen. Yeah. Hmm. Nila, come back. <laughs> hmm. What do we do now? I hope it's it's she will be coming back soon. Um, don't know what is happening. It seems yeah, really the internet is yeah. Now she's gone. Okay, <laughs> so um, um, yeah. Is there any more? I mean, for in general, now we had we we were first thinking about talking about the interconnection of climate change and biodiversity, and then going more into the governance, international governance body for it, and what is tackled there. Also looking at to what extent it actually drives, uh, tackles the drivers, and to what is then tended uh, actually, yeah, um, goes to the root root causes. Um, now we see that we have lot put a lot of content <laughs> into one webinar, and um. We probably will need another one to go deeper, uh, yeah, to really de go deep into the governance structure. But we wanted to at least start off with it this year now because this year is a is a big year, as we all know. And in Colombia, there will be the negotiations this year again to um, to look at what has happened until now, look at the national 
plans from other different countries, what they have provided um, and what measures they take and um, yeah, to concretize some more issues. But um, yeah, so what do we do now? <laughs> Joanna, maybe yes. one, one, one thought that I had is like uh, the one of the final points that she made about these nature-based solutions and uh, all of that debate, because it, it relates to finance, it relates to, well, where you get the money to to to, to promote the forestation or, 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 or to work on that. And, and maybe that is, is another point that we could further uh, discuss. Uh, a lot of a lot of different experience from uh, we, 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 I think the first seminar put something on, on that as well but uh, the issue of how we overcome the, the the narrative about we need money uh to do all of that and that is the only way and and the only way is doing with the private sector and the only way is uh all, all of that narrative that it is coming uh, particularly with countries that have, been struggling, which which is almost all of them, uh, struggling in finance. So, so how we overcome that narrative, and what are the the the, the possible solutions on that, and what are the uh, what are the goods, what are the bad initiatives, maybe examples, something like that. So, um, so that's what we should look in more into detail. You think, like uh, other ways of other solutions, um, and narratives, um getting away from this narrative of, ah, oh, now I think she's coming again, getting away from the narrative of, um, yeah, we need finance, we need finance, and by this inviting corporations to solve the problem for us in a way. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, we also next, next uh, the next series will also, um, again, focus specifically on offsets and all this, yeah, nature-based solutions and, um, uh, yeah, and then we definitely need space to talk about the alternatives, that's, yeah. That for sure. Not I, did, I didn't remember yeah. that. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's that's good. Nila, great, you're back. <laughs> Hi, I'm so so sorry. I don't know what happened. That's what happened. Internet... It's not in your oh, in your hands. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah, I don't know where you lost me. Um, but yeah, I was I was talking about the need to to have like biodiversity measures everywhere, not just in like sit aside this part of nature. But maybe I should go to the next part now. Mm -hmm. And okay. Nile, I think we can we can probably kick off with this now and get an impression of it, and then maybe we do an autumn, we deepen it a bit more for us to really understand because we don't have, yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> it's very, it's probably very, very difficult to get uh, to really dig into it in, in into depth. So let's um let's see that we all get a grasp of it, what is happening, and then we maybe have the chance to deepen it more in in future just to put the burden of exp exp expectations now what to do, what is possible yeah um yeah so looking forward um to continue to hear from you now on the governance sect uh, section and to see yes. what is done internationally in this regard yes um yeah i would like to share my screen but it seems to be still disabled so if you could enable that for me Okay, thank you. Um, I'll first briefly, before I go into my presentation again, I want to briefly show a brochure, which actually Henry Bell was a brochure, like a position paper, which we made, um, which Henry Bell was part of. And also, like as, as friends of Earth, we really worked a lot to bring this together. This was right before the global biodiversity frameworks. Well, it was in the very beginning, so forth, when it was the whole discussion was starting. And with a whole number of NGOs, we sat together and, and looked at um, what we actually thought was needed. So we thought that a real system change was needed. Um, and I really invite you to go and look through it. I'll, I'll send the link to this document later. It's also on the High Bell website, but we have it in three languages in Hawaii. So, I can't go into all the detail of it, <clears throat> but what it's talked about, like it needs to make sure we keep putting planetary boundaries to have principle based, um, to make sure that full IPLC participation, address the root causes of biodiversity loss, address equity, um, make sure that the government takes a very strong stance in it, make sure that all the different UN um, parts are 
coordinated in a common goal to this. Um, make sure that there's the public finance, that the finance is there for the things we are, that are needed for. Um, make sure there's biodiversity in all areas, not just in set aside areas. So all of these things which we have been talking about um, before already as well, agroecology, um, yeah, all of these things, and a number of things which we clearly didn't want, like, for example, no offsetting, no voluntary commitments, um, yeah, no techno fixes and things like that. So I just wanted to point you to this because this was actually where we started out with. And for me, this is still a reference, like how did we fare in the global biodiversity framework when we look at this is what we wanted in the beginning. So I'll stop this screen share and I'll go back to my presentation, um, which is in here. Yeah, okay. So yeah. As I said, this was the, the do's and don'ts. It was false, that's that, that, that publication. Also a very important input was the IPBES report. Um, so it was a global assessment on, on biodiversity and it really pointed to, well, they call, called it transformative change. And they said like, we need to address industrial agriculture, the fisheries, infrastructure, mining, energy extraction, logging, plantations, large scale bioenergy, endless growth and overconsumption. This was at the IPS, which is like the, the equivalent of the IPCC for, for biodiversity. So this is really important. You have actually international scientific bodies pointing to the system change we need. But then actually, how did we fare? So um, the, the global biodiversity framework, which was approved in December 2022, um, it has mission, vision, and goals, which are actually the mission, vision, and goals. You can read them later on, but they're quite, for me, like, they just put in all the right keywords there, but for me, they don't say exactly much. And then you have three broad sets of targets, one on threats to biodiversity, which would sound quite interesting, but actually, when you look at it, it's like, oh, let's make sure that there's no further extinction or things like that. First target is on spatial planning, which there was also, there's some good elements in there as it talks about including high integrity, indigenous peoples, etc. But there's also quite some worry that this spatial planning element is actually a planning element to, to enable offsetting. Second part is restoration, where it talks of 30% of degraded ecosystems and to be effectively restored. It's not clear what actually can qualify as degraded ecosystems, so it's a very strange um, target. But even worse is that there's no qualification whatsoever that this restoration cannot be used for offsetting. Target three on conserved areas is actually one of the huge things. You will have heard a lot about the 30% target, which a lot of us have actually had very severe questions around, especially as this this will this leads to this vision of like oh thirty percent aside as untouched nature don't allow humans in, and have the other seventy percent for humans for destruction. Um, so we had quite some opposition to this. The, the way it was finally brought up is um, the thirty percent is there that was inevitable, but there is some good elements in there like the the effectively managing the equitable governance systems, recognition of traditional territories, recognition of indigenous people's rights and things like that. So there is a number of good elements in there, but still there's also quite a lot of risk, especially if we see like how this will be implemented and measured and things like that. Um, next targets are about halting extinction, about harvesting and use of wild species. I'm not going to go into them, they're just kind of, they don't really give the specific actions that need to happen for them. So I think for, from my point of view, they're relatively weak, but yet they can be used. Invasive, invasive alien species, um, just to mention, like it's, it's good that they mentioned that we should reduce the pathways of introduction, which a lot of them are industrial based, like the, the, the container shipping and things like that. Um, very dangerous can be that there needs to be like specific con methods of controlling and, and the, the mention of islands, for example, is there is a, a danger for gene drives, which is a very specific way of, of using genetic engineering to actually extinguish certain species. And this can become very dangerous. I just wanted to briefly touch upon it. I, we can't go in depth. Um, 
Target seven on pollution has quite some interesting elements like excessive excess nutrients. We're talking about um, fertilizers, manure, things like that. Also, the mention of highly hazardous chem chemicals is quite important. Um, and yeah, plastic pollution, but I think there's there's a lot more development elsewhere than just this very short mention. And then target eight on climate. I want to stop here a little bit more because this is really linked to our talk of today. Um, so yeah, originally when we when in the original draft of the negotiations, it really was oriented towards how can biodiversity help the climate. There was a promise that biodiversity would contribute to the mitigation of 10 gigaton of carbon per year. Um, it was oriented to what can biodiversity do for nature. The final outcome actually doesn't say very much and minimize the impact of climate change and ocean acidification on biodiversity. How? What are the measures? Um, it does talk about nature-based solutions, so that's quite dangerous. It puts it next to ecosystem-based approaches, um, which is something which is well-defined in the conventions. It's decades old, and it really, well, it's based on the concept of ecosystems and how they interact with each other, etc. So uh, many of the negative nature-based solutions elements can't be there in ecosystem-based approaches. Unfortunately, even though both terms are there in the implementation, everybody focuses on nature-based solutions. And there is this element of minimizing neg negative impacts of climate action on biodiversity, which is something we hope to be able to develop further. And there is a text upcoming on climate and biodiversity for COP16. There's still an awful lot of work to do on the text, so it might not fly, but maybe there, we could use some of these elements in there. Um, though there's also a lot of, of dangerous elements in that text. Then the next um, big set of, of targets from target 9 to 13 is on meeting people's needs. Um, I'm not going to go into most of them, but I wanted to highlight, as you see here, agriculture. Um, agriculture was the big element which the IPBES report said, like, we need to do something about agriculture if we want to save biodiversity. The amount of fights that has been there on the agriculture targets has been one of the biggest one ever. Um, and when we look at this target, actually, it doesn't really do much. There's no, no clarity on where this goes to. There's so many of the keywords being put in there a bit for what everybody wants is in there, but there's no clarity. There's if you if you read this, there's not a consensus on policies that will tackle the impact of, of agriculture on biodiversity. Unfortunately, there's even a lot of very negative things, such as um, sustainable intensification, which means like even more, um, more in monoculture plantations um, or, or monoculture crops, um, more GMOs, et cetera, et cetera, under the claim that as they intensify, they don't need to use more land, which is then completely false. And they talk about agriculture, agroecological and other innovative um, approaches. So the innovative approaches, a lot of that is synthetic biology, it's extreme GMOs and things like that. So putting agroecology in there, which a lot of people fought to have agroecology in the, in the agriculture targets, they won, but the, the context in which it's posed as an, an innovative approach, it really makes it um, very dangerous. And then the, the focus on long-term efficiency and productivity um, is really dangerous. And in, in one of the first drafts on agriculture, it really the whole target was um, to make sure that we would help agriculture to become more productive. And we have shouted a lot about that thing, like it's not the task of the Convention on Bi Biological Diversity to make sure that agriculture becomes more productive, yet it's still there. So when we look at this, does this address the key driver of, of um, agriculture destroying biodiversity? No, not at all. And actually a lot of the very dangerous elements are still there. Well, and there's still a few others on ecosystem services, on, on urban and on equitable sharing of benefits of, of, of genetic knowledge. I'm not going to go into that. I want to still use a last few minutes, if I may, but please interrupt me if, if that's not okay. 
Um, but for me, the whole part on um, the, the implementation and mainstreaming is quite important. Um, so this the section from target 14 till target 21 is very important, where target 14 is the one which talks about government policies, regulations, planning and processes, and which should be organized to make that sure that all levels of government across all sectors actually make sure that all policies um, are in accordance to the goals and targets of this framework. So actually work for biodiversity. This actually could potentially give a lot of scope to do things, to push governments to work. Unfortunately, when we see there is a whole text on a long-term approach for mainstreaming, which will be coming up in COP16, when you look into the detail how this is being worked out, it's, it's absolutely horrid. Um, a lot of the policies which governments then should develop is, for example, on making sure that biodiversity offsetting can work or on how we value biodiversity and that kind of things. Still, when you look at the target, how it's written, there is some scope for using this. Target 15 is my favorite one to rant about, which is about how we are going to deal with business. And even though we fought a lot to make sure that it would be a policy thing, and then they say like, okay, let's have legal and administrative measures to encourage and enable business. How can we encourage and enable? You need to push them to do things. And then when you look at what they want us to, the, the business to do, is to monitor and assess their risks and dependencies so of the business on biodiversity as a first one. Uh, and maybe also a bit about the impacts on biodiversity in that order. Um, provide information needed so to consumers so that consumers can do more on, on buying the right kind of products and um, access and benefit sharing, which is a very complex topic. So I'm not going to, to, do, to, to go into that. Um, and during much of the negotiation, there was an element on human rights here and it was kicked out at the last moment. So this is really very bad. Um, and of, there's also this, this mention of increasing positive impacts of, of business on biodiversity. And what this means is business to do more offsetting and things like that. So because then they can like, if they, offset just a bit more than what they have destroyed, supposedly, it's a positive impact. So this kind of wording, which seems positive, is actually very negative. Then target 16 is about the task of consumers who should be consuming the right kind of products. So what we see is a shift away from policies towards making sure that business can just use um, their, um, what is it called? can use labeling and, 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 and some kind of, um, sorry, the words escape me. Um, and the business can, can be just giving information to consumers, which is mostly just greenwashing, and then consumers to be supposedly having to, write, to buy the, the right kind of products. And so it's the, it's the responsibility of the consumer who may not have the right information. Actually, the information provided is very often just false, it's greenwashing, and it's also very often just not available to consumers because it's more expensive or because in countries in the global south, this is not, um, this is not available. Certification schemes was the word I was searching for, which is like search about it. I could do a whole presentation on certification scheme, but most of them are a scam. So this is really a big part of like, when you look at these three targets and the way how they will be implemented, this can actually, in my vision, undermine almost all of the rest of the, of the, um, of the global biodiversity framework. Then we have uh, the, the long-term action plan on mainstreaming, which, which will be discussed in, in COP16. We'll implement this further, so it's, and it's full of all solutions. Um, let me just go through this very quickly. Then the next few targets, um, target 17 is on, on biotechnology, target 18 on subsidies, which is quite good that it's there, but there's also flaws in it. Target 19 on finance, but again, I mean, I could talk longer about this, but one of the big problems is that they are looking a lot into private finance, into biodiversity offsetting as a source of finance. So this is hugely problematic. And then yeah, I'm just skipping through targets 22 and 23 are really beautiful ones to, to, to look into and to use a lot um, because it talks about 
representation, participation, human rights, gender responsive approaches. So please have a look into these targets. They are really, really useful. Yeah, it's not that everything in the GBF is negative. Actually, as um, let me just stop my sharing. As for why we have made a few fact sheets um, where we have worked this out a little bit more in, in detail. Um, they are for now, they are, are on our website only in English, but in a few days' time, they should be there also in, in, in Spanish and French as well. Um, so I'm just quickly posting it here because a lot of this information is like explained in, in the fact sheet. And I'm also putting the link to the, to the do's and don'ts. I'm really sorry I had to run through this so, so quickly. I hope you have like a little bit of a, of a sense of, of what a GBS, GBF is. I'm very happy to, to step in later to, to complement or to give more information as well. And, and also happy to answer questions, but I know that time is up, so I don't know how to proceed now. Let's take another five more minutes, I think, to go to... Uh... To central questions and maybe also to collect what we should deepen in more in future and i think marcelo was pointing to this before already uh said uh, he said the, yeah to look more deeper into the financing of it and uh to see to alternatives to the to find alternatives to the narrative that we need finance from the private sector to solve everything um just um yeah to focus more on this and I think there's a lot of issues that would be very interesting to deepen. And I think we now got an overview of what is in the text. And I think it would definitely be interesting to look deeper into, um, yeah, into specific, uh, specific targets and maybe deepen on this in future. Um, yeah, I have a lot of questions as well, but I think we will probably not be able to solve of all, all of them now. Uh, maybe giving it back to the audience. Is there anything you would like to have raised now or comment. Thanks a lot, Nele. I think it was it was really great and I think it gave a very good um yeah um dive in <laughs> and now we have to go deeper but like an overview yeah um of um what is in the framework and I think from there um yeah we can deepen the discussion more. Very briefly on finance, I think definitely we need to move away from like how we need private finance, et cetera. We need to understand very clearly what are the impacts of using private finance, but also we need uh, to shift the discussion about what we need the money for. Um, because a lot of the biodiversity earmarked, fund, earmarked funding, it comes for very expensive consultants. It comes for readiness for biodiversity or other kinds of offsetting. It comes for writing reports. And what is actually, I would just really love to have a broad civil society debate about it with a lot of experts in it, which I'm not on finance. Um, but we needed this uh, the debate around what it is that really are the finance need if you want to, to save biodiversity. Um, I think that's a very important one. And we need to also contrast this with how much funds investment is going to biodiversity destructive activities and how can we possibly, with a bit of funds earmarked as biodiversity, actually contrast all of this destruction for which there's a multiple of funding. So I think this is really a debate which needs happening. And yeah, maybe it could be something for inviting somebody else. I can think of other people who, who know more about this than me, but for me, this, this discussion is quite important. Yeah, I think that's a good, a good way um, to stop to see that we need a lot of discussion to continue looking mm -hmm. on finance i would be very interested as well like on the yeah looking more at the drivers as you, as you were saying before like um, how they yeah some of the targets i think is are really interesting to look more into deeper maybe then also how we can use this narrative which you say is set out in target 22 and 23 how this can be used to yeah and um so i think we will would really like to invite you again Nele, <laughs> to go deeper into some of the issues and um, um, yeah, thanks a lot. I think also the linkage with climate change was really useful. And we will, um, yeah, we put this uh, webinar online. I think a lot of colleagues might be interested as well to go, go deeper into this and look specifically on this. And um, yeah, thanks a lot. I learned a lot today. Really, thank you. <laughs> thank you. You're very, very welcome. Okay, goodbye then.
Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.